Thank you very much. Is the microphone on? Can you hear me? Okay, uh, first off, I want to say a very big thank you to Christoph and to Hermoth for inviting me here as a Cassin Fellow. I want to thank all Cassin Fellows and staff. You've been very wonderful. I want to thank all of you who have made today this occasion very possible. I'm grateful to you. There are two staff of the Richard Cassis Center, or former staff who are not here. They were my very first friends. They were wonderful. And also like to acknowledge them. And these are no other but Andrea and um, Claudia. I want to thank Dawn for being a friend. Dawn, you are a Dawn in more than one ways. <laughs> I know that I don't have much time, so I'll go straight into the business of the day. My name is John Agbonfo. Uh, thank you. I feel like I'm in a fairy world for all those beautiful things you said about me. <laughs> Beginning from the 1980s and 1990s, after demonizing the African state as a clog in the wheel of progress. The Washington and post-Washington consensuses canonized civil society as best positioned for effective and efficient service delivery and overall development, including better management of environmental resources. Not surprisingly, there occurred a proliferation of civil society groups across Africa. Surprisingly, the expansion of civil society groups occurred in tandem with a deepening of environmental crisis in Nigeria. It seemed to me that the hope evinced by the architects of neoliberalism was misplaced. The problematic for me is, how do we reconcile the apparent contradiction between an activist growing environmental movement and deepening environmental crisis in Nigeria? I have an ambitious agenda for you today, but I know that I have only 20 minutes, 25 minutes, so I'm going to be very fast, and I hope that uh, you'll be able to keep pace with me. What I intend to do in a nutshell is introduce you to the Niger Delta, then we'll briefly look at the impact of oil exploitation in the region, and then I uh, will look at approaches to, or the approach that the state had adopted towards environmental movement, environmental management in the country. Then I'll briefly talk about the origin of modern environmentalism in Nigeria. Then I'll pose a few research questions. And then I will try to weave together a small theoretical framework within which I want to understand the problematic of this talk. Thereafter, I would uh, try to apply the theory to the concrete situation in Nigeria and then draw a few uh, conclusions. This is the map of Nigeria. Like you can see, Nigeria is bordered on the north by Niger, to the west by Benin Republic, and to the east by Cameroon, and south-south, you have the Atlantic Ocean. But the talk today is not about the entire environment of Nigeria. There are specific vegetation that I'm interested in. This talk is about the rainforest vegetation, the freshwater vegetation, and the mangrove vegetation. Together, they constitute the Niger Delta.
The Niger Delta is the largest wetland in Africa, covering some 70,000 square kilometers, one of the three largest mangrove swamps. It's a swampy maze of creeks, streams, mangroves, estuaries, and rivers. Importantly, it is also home to some 30 million people. This environment houses Nigeria's vast oil wells. <laughs> Exploitation of crude oil in commercial quantity began in the late 1950s. As of today, the SSI has had unimaginable human environment and environmental cost, not only for the people who inhabit the region, but also for the Niger Delta. Some of the consequences. The government or the Nigerian state has been concerned about the dark side of oil development. And attempts have been made to work against the destructive impact of oil exploitation. So we have a slew of interventions, command and control interventions aimed at managing uh, the environment. The unfortunate thing is that the regulations have been honored more in the breach. The rise of modern environmentalism in Nigeria can be traced back to two major events that took place in the late 1980s and early 1990s. The first was the dumping of toxic waste in Coco, a small village in the Niger Delta, by two Italian ships. And that was in 1987. This caused a lot of anxiety in the people and also was a motivation for the government to begin to enact laws geared towards the protection of our environment. The second event was the self-mobilization of aggrieved communities in the Niger Delta, communities that had suffered decades of environmental devastation. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, they began to mobilize and to demand for environmental cleanup, to demand for a right to the protection of their environment and for a share in the benefit of oil exploitation. So thereafter, we had proliferation of environmental movements in Nigeria. And uh, what I want us to understand is that the environmental movement in Nigeria is not a homogeneous entity. What we have is actually a variety of environmentalisms. And uh, for this, uh, for our purpose, the environmental movement in Nigeria can be categorized into three. The governance group, the emancipatory group and the hybrid group. The governance group, for example, examples of the governance group will be the Nigerian Conservation Foundation and the Nigeria Environmental Society. These are very elitist, specialized environmental groups. The governance group, they believe in technical physics and managerial approach to resolving environmental problems. They work in partnership with authorities in an attempt to resolve problems. They do not question injustice, and they do not embark on public protest against authorities when it comes to cases of environmental pollution in the country. Then we have what I call emancipatory groups. A very good example of an emancipatory group would be community mobilizations. A good one in this instance is the movement for the survival of Ogoni people. Musop, we watched the movie while we were having lunch, which was led by Ken Sarowiwa. These kind of environmental groups, they question the cultural code. They question the social political values upon which society is based. They adopt direct illegal actions like protest, 
to make their demands and demonstrate their grievances. Thereafter, we have the hybrid group. The hybrid group is critical of injustices, critical, publicly critical of environmental pollutions, but they do not adopt direct legal strategy like public protest. Like the governance group, they also believe in technical and managerial faces. A good example of a hybrid group would be the environmental right action, which is the Nigerian representative of Friends of the Earth International. My research questions are these. I have civil society concerned with the environment not translated into improved environmental outcomes. What is the nature of relations between the states and environmental movement? What are the contributions of the environmental movement to environmental governance in Nigeria? The political opportunity structure. Sorry. Now we are on to the theory. The political opportunity structure has argued that movements emerge and prosper when there is an opening up of the political structure, the political system. And movements dwindle and die when that opportunity is closed. In other words, movements have the opportunity to emerge and flourish in a democratic setting but lack such opportunity in an authoritarian environment. For those of us from this part of the world, that might make some sense to us. But for someone like me from a developing country, it doesn't tell the whole truth. Because we have had instances where a democratic government behaves in an authoritarian fashion and instances where a non-democratic authoritarian government behaves in a democratic fashion. But I have two basic problems with the political opportunity approach to this question. And the first problem is that it limits the possibilities of social movement to just two outcomes, opportunity to emerge and flourish, and then lack of, the lack of that opportunity which leads to its demise. But aren't there other possibilities between emergence and demise? And the second problem I have with it is that it does not create the opportunity for us to link, to relate the interest of a particular environmental movement or group to the interest of the state. All we know is that this regime is democratic or authoritarian. But what lies within or behind that democratic facade. What lies behind that authoritarian facade? We are not told. So I think I have a better framework to work on, and that is what we have there. And uh, the core of it is that the state has core imperatives. Historically, the European states have five core imperatives, like we have located there. But in addition to having these core imperatives, the argument is that a movement flourishes the moment the movement is able to connect with the core imperative or the core interest of the state. The alternative to that is that the moment a movement interest conflicts with the core imperative of the state, then of course the movement suffers and the movement fails. In effect, a movement succeeds when it is able to connect or align with the state's core. It fails when it comes into conflict with the state's core imperative. Based on the idea of core imperative, a state could be inclusive or exclusive. But it's also the case that a state can be actively inclusive, passively inclusive or actively exclusive and passively exclusive. And these are the authors, the two main authors I drew on for my framework. So let's get closer home. Home now is Nigeria. 
Building on the literature that we have just briefly reviewed, I argue that the Nigerian state, in addition to the five core imperative that we have seen, is beholden to a sixth core imperative. And what is this sixth core imperative? It is the facilitation of global capitalist accumulation. The post-colonial Nigerian state said the interest of global capital and it does so through establishment, protection, and expansion of the conditions of capitalist accumulation. The Nigerian state achieves its core, its sixth core function through the legalization of exploitation and dispossession. For example, in the late 70s, the Nigerian government came up with the land use decree, which removed ownership of land from communities and individuals and vested sin on the government. The implication is that in the Niger Delta, oil companies, big companies, do not have to approach local communities in order to acquire land. And they don't even have to pay compensation for the land they acquire for their activities. Then it also achieves its aim through dispolation of the environment and non-enforcement of environmental regulations. I told you earlier on that there's a range of environmental regulations, but that they were honored more in the breach. And, there, and this is the reason for that. So far, we have considered arguments about the link between the state and environmental movement. Now, let's examine how theory explicates state movement relation in Nigeria. Do I still have some time? OK, now we take the case of the governance group. Like I said, um, a good representation of this is the Nigerian Conservation Foundation. What's the objective? of the NCF. Its objective is to protect biodiversity, advocate for action that minimizes pollution, and uh, in many cases, it collaborates or partners with the government. For example, it was part of the drafting up of the Nigerian Conservation Strategy of 1994, as well as the Nigerian National Forestry Law of 2000. Usually, the strategy of the governance group revolves around partnership, scientific management of environmental problems, awareness creation, and environmental education. If we, if we lay up, if we compare this, the objective and strategy of the governance group against the state's core, which I have identified as the facilitation of global capitalist accumulation, we will discover that the governance group objective and strategy are not in conflict with the state's core imperative. And as a result, the government actively includes governance environmental groups into the state. There is collaboration between them and the state. And uh, I posed a question to the representative of the Nigerian Conservation Foundation. I asked him, uh, are you satisfied with what you are doing? If you are satisfied, why do we still have so many environmental problems in Nigeria? And this was his response. We want many pressing environmental problems in Nigeria solved. But we cannot force the government to do anything. The efforts of our NGO aim at the stage of advice. It is at the discretion of the state to use or reject our advice. To me, this is a proclamation and, a win and an acknowledgement of the limitation of, uh, of the governance NGOs. So now we we'll go on to the second group, the emancipatory groups. And I'm taking again the MOSO, Movement for the Survival of Ogoni People, as representative of this group. What was their objective? Some of their objectives were the right to control and use a fair proportion of Ogoni resources for Ogoni development. The right to protect Ogoni environment from further degradation. To me, this was a fundamental questioning of the status quo. 
because I, earlier on I mentioned that there were some 30 million people in the Niger Delta and we have several ethnic community groups within that region. Ogoni is just one of them and perhaps one of the smallest. So if the government were to grant the Ogoni the right to control and use a fair proportion of Ogoni resources for Ogoni development, then why would other communities, other ethnic groups in the region not demand the same? Why would they not make the same demand? Absolutely no reason. And if the government were to grant this demand, then of course that was going to eat into the government's purse. That would definitely cut down the resources or revenue available to the central government. Right to protect Ogoni environment from further uh, uh, degradation. Curiously, in Nigeria, no individual, no group has the right to take action to protect his or her own environment. No. It is only the government that has that right. And of course, the government is not everywhere. And even if the government was everywhere, we know that its interventions, its regulations, have been honored more in the breach. So what is the strategy of the emancipatory group? The Ogoni issued a public political demand in the form of a bill of rights. They adopted public protest, disruption of shells operation in Ogoni land, and then they also embarked on an internationalization of their struggle. Clearly, Ogoni objective and strategy were at variance in conflict with the state's core imperative. So the response of the state initially was passive exclusion because when the Ogoni issued the Ogoni bill of demand and demanded for compensation from both Shell and the state, there was absolute silence on the part of Shell and on the part of the state. They ignored Ogoni demand. However, Later on, when the Ogoni started the internationalization of the struggle, it sent a shock wave you know, down the spine of Shell and the state, and the state made an attempt towards active inclusion of the Ogoni. Ogoni leaders were invited to Lagos and Abuja and were asked what they wanted you know, to make demands that the government could speedily meet. But the Ogoni indicated to the government that what they wanted was more fundamental than just development projects like clinics, schools, and all of that. So thereafter, when the government failed in its, in, in its effort to incorporate the Ogoni leaders, it resulted to active exclusion of the Ogoni movement through military repression and the killing of Ogoni leaders. This quotation gives us, well, and it's not a quotation, but it gives us an insight into the mindset of the Ogoni movement, why their problem persists. The State Share Alliance will do anything to sustain its twin wall of political marginalization and ecological devastation against Ogoni in deference to its insatiable appetite for primitive accumulation. I took that from a month and a day by Ken Sarowiwa, 1995. Okay, the third group is the hybrid group. The objective of the hybrid group, a good example of the hybrid group is NAC-COND. I'm using NAC-COND, which is the national coalition against gas flaring and oil spills in the Niger. It's a coalition of several NGOs working against gas flaring and oil spill in the Niger Delta. Their objective is to lobby for new oil spill regulatory mechanism, advocacy to end gas flaring, and awareness creation. Their strategy include lobbying engagement with uh, stakeholders to secure compliance with environmental regulations, critical media campaigns, and mediating between oil firms and local communities. I asked the president of NACOND, okay, before I go on, uh, the state response to their activities. Hybrid groups, objectives, and strategy do not conflict with or threaten state's core, even if critical of the state. 
Therefore, state's response is passively exclusive and at times passively inclusive as occasion demands. I'll give you a good example of that. Um, okay, maybe later that will become clearer. I asked the president of NACCOND what his impression about the activity of his coalition was. And this was what he said. We engage with all stakeholders. We are, however, not satisfied with these engagements, categorically not satisfied. It is challenging to have a conversation with government officials. They are very defensive. We are not impressed with Ajip Mobile. They are the worst. They will go out of their way to avoid engaging with us. So having gone through the three categories of environmentalism in Nigeria, I now want to draw a few conclusions. The Nigerian state is not passively as inclusive or exclusive and not actively inclusive or exclusive. It is elusive in those terms. The Nigerian state is elusive in terms of democracy or authoritarianism. Also, it is elusive in those terms. It is any or a combination of these things. The fate of environmental group in Nigeria is determined by the nature of its relation to the state's core imperative. We have seen that those who do not threaten the core imperative of the state are welcome or included, actively included or passively included. But those that threaten the state's core imperative, they suffer a different fate. When we talk about environmental governance, there is little of a governing style of networks that bring stakeholders from the oil and gas industry, the state and civil society together to collaboratively work towards solving specific environmental problems. In effect, environmental movements in Nigeria are reduced to attempt to influence the oil companies and the government. Are you hungry for more? Thank you. 